So now, uh, now we will turn to, to our speaker, Anne Wright. Uh, I want to start, I was just starting to look at her book, uh, Descent, and there's a great quote from uh, Daniel Ellsberg. who wrote the foreword, says that uh, if you're at all like me, you will have a whole set of new heroes when you finish reading this. And Anne is one of the, one of the heroes of, of our country, really. Um, she worked as a colonel in the Army and as a diplomat for more than 35 years. She resigned on March 19, 2003, the day before we began bombing in Iraq. And she showed great moral courage then and continues now. And we need this kind of leadership in, in our country. Uh, one way I got to know her was uh, because of her work on environmental issues in the state, military-related environmental issues in her home state of Hawaii, where uh, the local community around the Red Hill uh, Military Fuel Depot had suffered because of leaking of fuel uh, from, from the World War II era fuel tanks. That was of great interest to me because we have, we have even more, I think, fuel tanks, World War II era fuel tanks at the Manchester Fuel De Depot here, uh, not, not far away from, from where we are right now. And, and so many of us are very concerned about the environmental impacts of, of, those, of those old fuel tanks that are located on a, on a seismic fault zone uh, and right by the water. In our beautiful, in our beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, so, so one of the things that impresses me is that even though she's traveling all over the world, doing all this activism with Veterans for Peace and Code Pink, she still has time to put out this daily newsletter, <laughs> a daily newsletter, like talking about all the activities that local activists are doing, and includes like all kinds of pickets and meetings and. Uh, new, relevant news articles. I just think it's very impressive. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to give a shout out for doing that because that's the kind of slog. <laughs> that's the kind of like activist slogging that that we need. I think that many of us are used to doing. So anyway, given this this critical moment with all these tensions in the world, both between conflict and environmental issues. I'm, I'm pleased to invite Anne as our, as our key speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And it's great to be here at Ground Zero. My goodness, I've heard about this place for a long, long, long time. And it's great to be here. And thanks to Kit and Keith for putting me up at their lovely home now. And, and to see a lot of old friends that are here. It's uh, uh, really great to see people from all over the Northwest that are here, and we certainly want to welcome our friends from the Marshall Islands who will be telling us a lot about, about uh, the effects of nuclear weapons, which is really the key thing that we're, we're talking about here uh, in this annual gathering that we have uh, on, around the weekend of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Kathy, thank you very much for uh, you know, the leadership that you have for Ground Zero. Uh, we have a Hawaii Peace and Justice uh, organization in Honolulu where I live. Um, I live in Honolulu because when I resigned from the government 20 years ago over the Iraq War, I was living in Mongolia. And it was 40 below zero in Mongolia. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was cold as could be. Every morning I was getting up writing more things about why I, I was so distressed about what uh, the US government was about to do to attack, invade, occupy Iraq, that um, you know, I was getting up every morning writing more things. And finally, I came to the point that I resigned from the government. and. I was one of three U.S. diplomats that resigned. Um, that was after being in the, the diplomatic corps for 16 years. I served in a lot of places where I may have seen you all outside the, the U.S. <laughs> Embassy protesting U.S. policies in, in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia. Micronesia, right down the road from our Marshall Islands friends. 
Um, I helped reopen the embassy in Afghanistan in January of 2001, and then went on to what ultimately became my last assignment, which was as the deputy ambassador at the U.S. Embassy in, in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. So it was freezing cold there, and the first thing the State Department sent back to me after I had resigned was, where do we send your stuff? It wasn't like, oh, we're so sorry that you don't agree with us, or da 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 It was just like, oh, get out of here. We don't need your criticism. Get on out, and where do we send your stuff? So I said, well, I want to get warm, and it was Hawaii. And I've been using, <laughs> being in, in Hawaii ever since. And Kathy mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of social justice issues in Hawaii. It's one of the most militarized places in the whole world with, on the island that I live on. Uh, Oahu, we have four major military bases. We have submarines that are coming in all the time, and of course the U.S. government doesn't tell us whether they have nuclear weapons on or if they are still storing nuclear weapons in Hawaii. There is a suspicion that probably they are. Um, so uh, having resigned from the government, and that was after 29 years actually in the U.S. military, and the, and 16 on active duty, and 13 in the reserves, and a shout out to all of us who are part of Veterans for Peace or veterans that are sitting here today. How many vets do we have? Well, and, you know, trying to get uh, word to our dear friends who are still in the military to say there are a lot of people that are challenging what uh, policies our, our elected officials have on how our, our communities uh, operate, you know, and operate in the whole issue of militarization of our societies in so many different ways. So, you know, whenever you run into a um, military guy or gal, chat them up, you know, talk to them about what's happening. And uh, I think you might be a little surprised at some of the positive vibes you get back from them. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of going through a, a series of uh, events. And as Kathy mentioned, I do a lot of speaking around the world. And uh, you know, it's because of, of the background that we have coming out of the government. A lot of people want to hear our version of what the current status is of our government policies. And it, even though it was 20 years ago, was the last time I was in the government. How long have you been retired? 25. Oh, 25, yeah. But still, I mean, of what we saw Tom explaining to us, it's important that people that have, have had this background um, are here speaking. And that's why I'm looking forward to our friends from the Marshall Islands and what they have to say because they've been through it all. And so today we thank you very much for uh, Ground Zero hosting uh, this annual get-together. It's the first time I've been to Ground Zero, although I've heard about this place forever. So thank you for the kind invitation to be here. Uh, while we are here, you know, it's the August 5th here, but it's already August 6th in Japan. And in Japan, the commemoration of Hiroshima, August 6th, the dropping of the, the bomb on Hiroshima, those, those uh, meetings are going on right now. In fact, how many of you all have ever been to Hiroshima or Nagasaki for, for the events, the commemorations? They're very, they're very, very well, um, emotional, and uh, just I put a couple of slides up here. This one on the right is uh, for this evening, uh, where they'll be floating the lanterns for all of those that were killed in Hiroshima. Uh, over on the left is uh, a reminder, you know, that uh, people in Japan remember what happened to them, and there certainly is a, a large movement uh, to say no more war even though the United States is continuing putting pressure on the Japanese government to throw out their peace constitution, their constitution that says that they will not be a part of any aggressive, uh, offensive military actions, that their self-defense force will not be using uh, any weapons in an offensive nature. But that's going down the tubes fast as the U.S. keeps putting pressure on Japan and on Australia and on New Zealand and South, South Korea to be the partners in NATO. 
and NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, <laughs> but now it's the Pacific. And other things, uh, you know, organizations that we've worked with, and you all up here have been the host to our Veterans for Peace historic anti-nuke sailboat called the Golden Rule. How many of you all have been a part of that? Yay! And I would like to acknowledge that Captain Tom Rogers was on the Golden Rule in 2019, and here we have a picture of him right back there he is. He was, he was, he was on the, the Golden Rule. How many days did it take you all to get over? 21 days. 21 days. 21 to go. horrible days. 21 horrible days. <laughs> well, let me just say it wasn't as horrible as the gang that brought the boat back two years later. Uh, in 2021, it took them 29 days to get back. And as they said, when we met them in Sausalito, they came into Sausalito, and uh, we were on the phone with them, you know, as they got in phone contact. And uh, uh, it was like, well, what can we do for you? Oh, well, we want real coffee. Uh, <laughs> we want a pizza. And we want a warm shower because we had been cold ever since we left Honolulu 29 days ago. We were wet and cold. <laughs> so we thank Tom. And then, let's see, Ed, you've been a part of the Golden Rule in the last couple of weeks, haven't you? Last couple of months. Yeah. Last couple of months, he's been doing filming for the Golden Rule. As it, uh, uh, well, before I tell it more of your story, this banner, Make Hawaii and the Pacific Nuclear Free, that is a 50 year old banner that was used 50 years ago in Honolulu. And uh, uh, Jim Albertini, who's one of the big uh, peace activists in, on the Big Island, he dragged that out of his basement and brought it out so that our anti-nuke sailboat could have it right on, on there as they arrived in August, was it 2nd of 2019? It was this week. Yeah. So we thank them very much. And that Golden Rule, which is a Veterans for Peace national project, uh, has, well, I'll, a couple of more pictures. There we go, Tom. See that? With the little lay and then several the members of the crew. <laughs> <laughs> you look awfully young there. <laughs> that beard. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, Helen Jacquard is the um, project manager. She's been the manager of that boat for now seven years. And uh, uh, it has really done a lot of educational events. While, you, while the boat was in Honolulu, or in, in the islands of Hawaii, we went to all of them but one. Over a hundred educational events on the importance of, of our community, putting pressure on our elected officials to say, we don't want nuclear weapons. And we were able in Honolulu to get a city resolution saying no more nuclear weapons. I don't know that they would pass it now, but <laughs> they did then. Um, the Golden Rule has embarked on a, another major trip, uh, and it is uh, what's called the Great Loop. And we trucked the, the boat uh, from the West Coast after it got back from Hawaii. Uh, we put it on a truck and took it up around the, Min the Minneapolis area, and it's been coming down the Mississippi River, having educational events all the way down, and one of the most important events and the most um, where the community got behind it the most was in Des Moines, Iowa, where there is a large Marshallese uh, community and they greeted the Golden Rule with all sorts of wonderful community events. So we were really thrilled with that. Uh, then we had, because the Mississippi at the time was uh, without water in many places, or so little water that commercial traffic couldn't go down the river. So we had to divert over to the Tennessee River and then come down to the Gulf Coast, down the west coast of Florida, educational events all the way. And then over Janu uh, January 1st, I went down to Cuba. Mm. And that was, that was really, really fascinating to get the permission to bring the, bo the boat down into in Havana and then the crew and others uh, made a trip down to Cuba and had a remarkable time uh, with the Cuba Cuban community. Then back up the East Coast, and then, Ed, you joined them where? In Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so events all the way up the, the uh, coast. And then here's a picture over on the, this side, the right, uh, of the Golden Rule and the Statue of Liberty behind it. And that was, I believe, during the 4th of July weekend. Well, the boat now is on the way. It's already been up. Let's see, it's gone this way, then it's come back, and it's going into the Great Lakes, and we'll eventually get to Chicago, where we will take her out of the water again and truck her back to the West Coast. And everybody will take a little breather. The little boat will get <laughs> to get to breathe for a while. It's only 38 feet long. It's a tiny, really... How tiny is it? Tom? It's a lot tinier than 38 feet, because 38 feet is from the very tip of the bow to the very end of the rudder. <laughs> and it's a lot smaller. And oh, by the way, it's wooden, it's heavy, it's unstable in any kind of way. <laughs> I'm, I'm done talking. <laughs> single person that's been on it says they would love to go back on it again. Yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> on a river. <laughs> on a river. Yeah. And uh, probably it would take 20 of these to be as the length of one nuclear submarine. If it's yeah, 600 it's feet, right. yeah. 20 of the size of that little boat right there. Anyway, I just wanted to let you all know because the Golden Rule has been up here in the Northwest uh, many, many times, and we anticipate that she will be coming back up here again, and we look forward to, uh, uh, to you know, your welcoming her again. Uh, yes. <laughs> in 2016, Golden Rule led a flotilla of ships, uh, sailboats, uh, and kayaks and power boats down the Hood Canal and did the first waterborne blockade of the Bangor submarine base since 1980. And we were accompanied by no less than uh, two Coast Guard cutters, <coughs> six Navy security boats, and one Kitsap County Sheriff boat. <laughs> Well, let's do it again then. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that history. Wow. Well, I'm going to go from the Golden Rule on to some other things. And I just have come back from five weeks in Europe. And I want to go through some of these places where I was very fortunate to get to, to go to conferences and speak at conferences. The first one was the International Summit for Peace in Ukraine. And why am I bringing it up? Well, it's the current war. The current war that the U.S. is and NATO are a part of, even though they keep saying, no, we're not really. Uh, you all probably know the history of how this has all come about. I won't go into that. What I want to talk about, though, is that we had over 300 people that came to Vienna, Austria, uh, to talk about peace and how do you get warring parties to stop killing each other. My role in it was to talk about the history of ceasefires. And, you know, that's... The way the, the end of war started is you talk, you talk about how to end killing each other. Uh, in the Korean War, which was 70 years ago, a three-year war, the negotiations to end the war started at the end of year one and continued for two more years. 575 meetings took place between Koreans, North, South, U.S., China, it was, it was two years it took to get the ceasefire, and in that period of time, millions of Koreans were killed. Millions of them. They estimate four million. 500,000 Chinese were killed, and, three, and 33,000 U.S., and about 5,000 U.N. forces. So all the time, people were talking about ending the war, but people kept getting killed and killed. The Vietnam War started, you know, 15-year war. The negotiations started in 1968. They ended in 1975, and during that time, millions of Vietnamese, North and South Vietnamese. We had 55,000 U.S. We had another 20,000 of other Allied forces that were killed while the talks were going on. So the point of this conference, uh, which was not pro-Ukrainian, not pro-Russian, it was just pro, let's get this thing done, 
uh, was, you know, how do we how do we get parties together uh, to talk? And there was no ultimate resolution on how you do it. <laughs> uh, we do know since this the let's see the South the African nations have tried to get the warring parties together. That didn't work. That was a week and a half ago. Uh, the Saudi Arabians are on it now, trying to get both parties to come together and start talking. And uh, we should be encouraging our government to not stand in the way which it has done in the past and stand in the way of any sort of negotiations. So this was very interesting with 300 people from primarily all over Europe uh, and, and borderline countries with Russia, uh, Poland, Lithuania, uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, people there saying, you know, we're, we, have, we are showing the effects of this war in our societies and we want it, we want it to end. So that was a very interesting uh, thing. Then another uh, event that just has happened was on another part of the world, uh, the 70-year uh, the war uh, that still officially is going on on the Korean Peninsula because we don't have a peace agreement, it's only uh, it's only an armistice that was signed in 1953. And so we mobilized about 400 people came to Washington, D.C. to be a part of the uh, national mobilization to say we want our government to push for discussions with North Korea, with China, with all of the parties of that war, and let's come to an agreement so that the North Koreans don't feel like they are being threatened by the United States. And that's what they feel. They feel the United States is, is uh, trying to overthrow their government. And when we have the largest ground exercises uh, since the end of the Cold War are now going on, have gone on in the last two months in South Korea, right along the demilitarized zone, uh, when we have B-52s that are flying right along the demilitarized zone right now, when the first time in 40 years we put a nuclear submarine into one of the ports of South Korea. You know, it doesn't really give the North Koreans any, uh, any trust in us not having a policy of regime change. I was in North Korea. Have any of you all been to North Korea? Every now and then there's a hand that pops up and it's like, how did you get there? Why, did, why, why were you there? Well, I went with uh, 30 international women from 15 countries, two Nobel Peace Laureates, with what was called Women Cross the DMZ. And this was in 2015. Uh, we talked with North Korean women, 250 of them, that were selected by the North Korean government, no doubt about that, but they told us what the effects of the, the three-year war uh, in Korea still had on them 70 years later, 70 years later. Then we went across the DMZ, only the third civilian group ever allowed to cross the DMZ into South Korea and met with 400 South Korean women who talked about the effects of the Korean War still on them and the divided families, the, the families in South Korea that have family in North Korea and the Korean Americans here in the United States, you know, that have family members of their no North Korea. The U.S. has a, a, a travel ban on us going to North Korea now. It happened during the Trump administration, and that was when one very a young uh, American, Otto Wambier, um, went to, to North Korea on a beer tour. There's an over, overnight train from Beijing that takes tourists up to North Korea, uh, and he was on one of those, and apparently, um, during the course of this, he went into a hotel and started ripping down some posters, and that is something you don't do in North Korea, you don't yeah. rip up stuff. And so he was uh, arrested, and I mean, tragically, uh, he ended up uh, suffering something, and he ended up dying just as soon as he was released here. A terrible, horrible thing. Uh, but from that, the Trump administration said, okay, no more Americans going there unless you get a special validation passport from the State Department. <gasps> And the only ones that have been issued in the, in the past two, two and a half, three years uh, have been for just a very few non-governmental organizations that have had long-term programs in North Korea. Did you know the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, have had 
agricultural programs in North Korea for 35 years. The Mennonites have had agricultural programs in North Korea. And these are very important programs. Uh, it's important for us as American citizens to go to places where our country does not want us to go. <laughs> we, we need to see why it is that the U.S. government says you should not go to Cuba, you should not go to Iran, you shouldn't go to Yemen, you shouldn't go to North Korea. We need to go there and see what the impact of U.S. sanctions and U.S. policies have been on these. So we do have a program that's coming out of this uh, 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 Korea piece now, which is to lift the travel ban, to help divided families get to travel to see their loved ones in, in North Korea, and for North Koreans to be able to come here. Uh, until this travel ban, we have had North Korean students that have been students in American universities, uh, not a lot of them, but, but some. And we need this cultural interchange for the safety and security of our own world. Uh, this, uh, oh, and it's not just a mobilization uh, for peace in the Korean Peninsula that we did in Washington, but at the same time in Korea, the picture over here is of uh, uh, South Koreans who went to all of the military bases in South Korea and and had uh, encircled the bases to say, we want, we want peace. We don't want the continued militarization of our peninsula. Okay, and then as a part of this uh, mobilization, we had a, a one-day conference in Washington, and two of the most interesting speakers were a retired Lieutenant General of the Air Force, Dan Leaf, who was the Deputy Commander of the Pacific Command uh, he, after he retired from the Air Force, he wrote an article about the need to look at a different, different perspective on, on, on Korea, on issues of the Korean Peninsula. And this essay that he wrote got an international award. Well, I had never heard of this. I, you know, a lieutenant general writing something like this. It wasn't until he got in touch with Christine Ahn, who also lives in Honolulu, who is the executive director of Women Cross the DMZ, the group that organized us to go to North Korea and then South Korea, he got in touch with Christine to say, I just read about you in the newspaper and you're working for peace on the Korean Peninsula, and I, I think I am too. And it was like, <laughs> a lieutenant general doing this? And uh, so they met and uh, started talking, and she said, well, if you're really interested, we would love to, to um, you know, have your interest in this publicized. Would you consider writing an opinion piece for a newspaper about your essay and why you've changed kind of your mind on, on what U.S. policies on the Korean Peninsula should be? And he went, well, I guess so. Well, his essay came out in the New York Times. In the New York Times. And so we've kind of, like, Tom and I as kind of He's a captain in the Navy. I was a colonel in the Army. And for years, we were kind of the highest ranking military that had been in Vets for Peace and you know, speaking out like this. And then finally, we get a general. <laughs> <laughs> a general that's on our side. Yeah. So uh, Dan, Dan came to the conference. And um, uh, his, his point, as I've mentioned here, nuclear war is only one mistake away. He is a person who has had all sorts of experience with nuclear weapons, with the Air Force, of flying nuclear weapons around and housing them on Air Force bases and stuff like that. He is very clear. He said, we are so close to a mistake that could just be the horrific mistake of the century. The other person on the panel was Siegfried Hecker, who is the American who has spent the only American who has ever been in the North Korean nuclear facilities. He was the head of Los Alamos. And the North Koreans, back in the days when there was actually discussions going on between North, North Korea and, and the US, they invited him to come see the nuclear facilities. At that time, they had not developed nuclear weapons. And he has written a book about but what's called, he calls the hinge points, the places where there was an opportunity that the U.S. and North Korea could have resolved some issues, starting back in the Clinton administration. Uh, 
It's, it's a book that will just tear your heart apart because there, there is no reason for us to be having the confrontations we're having now. There, there are opportunities that these two countries, our country and North Korea and others, can get together if the politicians will just let it happen. And that's the problem. We've got warmongering politicians in both parties. So this was a really, really important uh, collection of people. We haven't posted yet the recording of this panel, but it should be coming up the next week or so. And I'll be glad to send the link to you all, because it's really interesting to hear these two guys speak. Another event that I went to was actually back in, uh, in Europe uh, for the No to NATO. Every year when NATO has its summit, whether it's in Warsaw, Poland, where last year it was Madrid, Spain, this year it was uh, in Lithuania, but we didn't have any peace groups in Lithuania that could kind of host a group of internationals to come and, and be there as the heads of the NATO countries have their summit. So we decided we would, we would go to the headquarters of NATO, which is in Brussels, and a new group called Global Women for Peace United for, Against NATO formed up just six months ago. Women that I never even run into in all of the times I've been at, at, at events in Europe and other places, a whole new group of people that said, I want, uh, I, I want to work on stopping NATO's aggressive actions that are, that are jeopardizing the security of the whole world. So we had about 45 women that were actually in Brussels, but then we had uh, webinars that were coming from all over the world with women that were concerned about NATO actions in their part of the world. Next year, we want to invite all of you all to come to Washington, D.C., because that's where the 75th anniversary of NATO is going to be held. The NATO summit will be in July, yeah, there we go. There's a guy that's coming. I can tell by his reaction. <laughs> uh, uh, July uh, 9th through 11th will be the, the actual summit in Washington, D.C. We don't know where they're going to have it yet. Uh, and the weekend preceding it is the July 4th weekend, which is it's going to be a challenge for us to get people there, you know, 4th of July and all that stuff. What's going to happen, though, is we're going to have, of course, a rally at the White House, no to NATO. Uh, we'll have a march somewhere in Washington, and we'll have a conference, and we'll have speakers from all over the NATO countries. So put this on your plan for July, and we'll be, we'll be getting back with you with the actual timing of it, and hope that you can come. Okay. Um, so while we mentioned just a minute ago that in Hiroshima and Nagasaki right now, there are events that will be going on to commemorate the dropping of the bombs there. Uh, in Europe right now, there are activists that are going to some of the nuclear bases uh, to have demonstrations there. And one is at Vogel in the Netherlands, and you can see here, um, this is Brian Terrell, which many of you all may know. He's probably been here to speak. He's a Catholic worker from Iowa. Uh, he and a group of friends were digging, maybe we should consider this here, were digging a, a trench under the fence at the air base where nuclear weapons, U.S. nuclear weapons are stored uh, in the Netherlands. They were digging under and then they, were, they ended up going over and getting arrested inside the fence line. So they've done that for two or three years in a row. <coughs> the most, the oldest, um, European protest is at Buchel in Germany, and here's a couple, of, a picture of just a couple of folks that are blocking the air base, the German air base, where U.S. nuclear weapons are stored, uh, <coughs> blocking the, the fence line there. Uh, they do a lot of creative things. One year they had a symphony orchestra come and set up their orchestra right in front of the gates, and they played music for a while. And, I guess the German guards liked it because they let them play quite a few tunes before they didn't, they didn't arrest the tuba guy, but they, they <laughs> shoot him play. <laughs> and so what else is going on in the world today? What other things can we uh, be a part of? Well, September 17th in Washington, or in New York City, is going to hopefully be a very big march to 
uh, you know, to end fossil fuels. Uh, so if you're on the East Coast and can get to, to New York City on September 17th, the more people, the better. I, were any of you at the last one, maybe five years ago, that we had in New York? And there were like 50,000 people that showed up for that. It's really important with global change, global everything that's happening now that we show our concerns, and this is one of the ways. Uh, another one is uh, on the issue of wars and uh, peacemaking. Uh, the Peace in U Ukraine uh, Coalition, Worldwide Coalition, has called for actions between September 30th and, and uh, October 8th and to try to do something in your community to say, let's stop the killing, stop wars yet one more time. And then other things that are happening, our Veterans for Peace National Convention uh, will be at the end of this month, August 25th, 27th. It again will be online. Ever since COVID happened, we've had online uh, conventions, which actually have turned out very well. Uh, the recordings of all the panels have been excellent, and they're there for everyone to, uh, to uh, uh, use you know, in your own community events. Uh, our speakers are going to be Claire Daly, who is a spitfire from Ireland. Boy, I tell you, if you want to hear somebody rip one another one, this lady, she, she is good. In fact, we, Medea Benjamin and I were in Europe at the same time, and uh, uh, Claire invited us to go over to Ireland to speak on the issue of Irish neutrality, which, of course, the U.S. is trying to undercut. And we've been doing it throughout the Iraq War. The U.S. was uh, sending U.S. combat troops in, in contract planes and landing in Shannon Airport and then sending them on to the Middle East. Well, so we've had a lot of people that have been arrested there saying this is, you know, what the U.S. is doing is compromising your neutrality. And we've had two members of Veterans for Peace, Tarek Koff and um, Ken Mayers, who were arrested on the tarmac of the airport and ended up having their passports taken and they got stuck in Ireland for like nine months before the, their trial was held. But the bottom line is uh, Claire and the Irish folks are uh, good activists. Then of course we have Jeffrey Sachs, an economist that's been speaking a lot about wars, and Kathy Kelly, dear friend Kathy Kelly of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. So that's uh, something that you can see online. Uh, then uh, the World Beyond War will be having its annual conference, again, online, and that'll be in September, September 22nd, 24th. So there are a lot of things that are coming up that we would uh, hope that you will find interesting and will uh, will tune in on. And having, you know, getting groups together to maybe watch right here at Ground Zero, watch some of these things would be, would be really useful. And then seeing what you can do here as we ask all the communities to do things. So these are some of the things that we've, uh, we've been working on. There are a lot of other issues, of course, Kit and I were in Ireland together uh, for the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, uh, the, for solidarity with Palestine. We have a boat that's now going around um, Europe on a European tour, which will uh, be educational events in 12 different ports in Europe, and then next year we'll be sending the boat on to the Mediterranean to challenge, physically challenge, the Israeli blockade of, of Gaza. So there are a lot of issues that we have, and um, I know you all are concerned about, about these. And I hope this has given you a little look into some of the things that are going on around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, man. Uh, we have time for some questions, if, okay. if you're okay. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's go ahead. So, so we have time for questions. Okay. George. Uh, and thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I've taken careful notes to take back to our Spokane group. But one of the frustrations I was going to ask you about is uh, an activist friend of mine in Spokane says, we go to rallies, we go to conferences, and then the rally and the conference ends, this conference will end, and we all go home. And then what happens when we go home? Could you address that? Sure. Uh, I think the things that we have to do with the information we gain from these conferences is put pressure on people that it can actually affect the change. 
And so where are those pressure points? Uh, in general, they're with our U.S. Congress and our, our representatives that you all know in each one of your communities who your U.S. rep is and who your senator is, and trying to get uh, to know them or know their key staffers and to be able to present the information that you feel is important on any of these subjects and mobilize community action when they have town halls, when they, you know, when they're out and about or flooding them with uh, phone calls or emails, things like that to try to affect change. Well, just a follow-up, mm -hmm. our, our group in Spokane has spoken with the staffs of U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell and U.S. Senator Patty Murray, they are not interested yeah. in the topics that we bring up. Then vote them out of office. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> they're both entrenched. Oh, I know, and that's where that's our big problem, isn't it? That we have people that uh, that are entrenched. That that and how do they get entrenched? Because they get lots of donations from the military-industrial complex, from the big corporations that make money out of war. And they're unwilling to move their positions, their war, pro-war positions, uh, because that's where they get their their donations to run their campaigns. So, you know, it's not like uh, the American electoral system is a good one. I mean, it, we we have lots and lots of problems with that, and trying to get good candidates to run for political office. I mean, I'd never do that. I mean, I I don't want to be a part of that mess. But we got to find some people that will go ahead and do it and challenge them. And uh, it may take a while, but... These candidates normally lose. Well, yeah, they lose until they win. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got you to just keep after it. It's a system that we know is, I wouldn't say rigged, I mean, but in one way it is, because it's whoever gets the most donations usually gets the most uh, publicity and the most this and the most that. But, I mean, that's where the decisions are made. Uh, and at the presidential level, we have a presidential election that will be coming up. And uh, depending on whether or not there are actual debates, <laughs> which, you know, that's, that's another big challenge. What, what is happening to our system where candidates say, no, I don't think I'll debate. I don't want to talk about this. Well, we want you to talk about it. We want to know what your opinion is of this, that, or the other thing. So trying to do electoral um, uh, work is is really important even though it's painful um, but that's where the action is it's we can sit out here as citizens and rail all we want to but unless we get to the people that actually make the votes on the largest military budget in the history of the world 880 billion dollars 10 percent more than last year which at the time was the biggest military budget and it just keeps going up and up and up and up so um, it's not like there's a magic uh, solution to it all. It's going to take a lot of hard work, a lot of pushing, and years to do it. If you look at what uh, the right wing has done, it's been 30 years that they've been working to get kid, people on school boards, that, that uh, people that can run for political office, that have some backing. I mean, there is a reason why uh, our the tone of our Congress has changed, the tone of many school boards has changed, is because there's been a concerted effort by a group of very well connected and rich people to fund elections that have gotten the people they want in. Now we're not rich, but we can organize, and that's what we have to do. We can't just sit back and say, well, darn, how did they do that? Well, we can do that if we do it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this, this movie Oppenheimer came out, got a lot of attention. And after that, I read a, an essay by somebody connected, had connections to the Manhattan Project and their uh, grandfathers and that kind of thing. And, and they came out saying, well, they, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were worth it because they stopped the war sooner. What's your response to that? Bullshit. <laughs> Well, there are good references to the fact that within the government they were saying, yeah, the war on uh, Japan will be ending in about four, four, four weeks. That uh, the pressure that has already been put on the Japanese government means that they are going to 
uh, be ready to stop the wars. So there's that. There's there's data to that. Uh, if you if you look at the movie Open, Oppenheimer, and if you actually read that book, which I have not done, but I've thumbed through it, it's about that big. And uh, when you when you read parts of that, uh, you know they were the scientists themselves were saying, we don't want to make that moral decision. We are making we are scientists making an object. What happens to the object is not our problem. And that's where Oppenheimer later went. Well, actually, it was our problem. And that's where Einstein, even in the movie, said, I don't want to have anything to do with that. We know what's going to happen. It's going to be terrible. So, uh, yeah, you know, I it's kind of... Big from like, 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 when yeah. Myers book does it. We yeah. Well, we... Myers book on, on war, I believe, gives all that history. Right? Yeah, the, the history is out there. So <laughs> Some of that has been kind of suppressed. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, of course it's been suppressed. <laughs> yeah. that, that's the nature of, of all of this, that... They they don't really want to publicize the fact that there were you know there were a lot of debates uh, going on about whether to use this uh, horrible weapon and there the debates continue to this day. I mean, why in the hell should we be having all of these nuclear weapons here? Well, because the debate is we may have to use them. We may have to use all of them to kill everybody on Earth. And it's like, well, that's a real moral decision. Thank you very much. You're going to eliminate the human race by this, and while we do have the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, uh, which countries haven't signed it? All the ones that have the nuclear weapons. So all the great efforts of genuine, uh, heartfelt people that don't want our, our collective humanity to be killed, all of this work, and yet we've got the nine countries that say, tough noogies, we're going to keep them and we may use them. And that's where this whole Ukraine thing uh, in North Korea is so, you know, so dangerous because at any moment, one, one side may say, okay, let's just do a little tactical nuke somewhere. And all it is is a nuke that's whatever. And the, net, the other side goes, okay, you did it. You did the first use and we go next. Yeah, and then that in, next. In your experience, how? Uh, what type of event or cause changes a person from a war sympathetic person to an anti-war uh, person? Well, and the question was, what, what may be a precipitating thing that may turn somebody that's been kind of pro-war into, uh, let's not do the wars? I mean, I was in the government for 35 years. I wasn't necessarily pro-war, but I wasn't actively doing anything to stop any of it. Uh, for me, it was the, the uh, pending war with Iraq and knowing full well what the destruction was going to be in human lives and infrastructure was like, haven't we figured this thing out yet that this doesn't work? You know, and I was 50 some odd years old at that point. And while many of you all at age 16, you'd already figured it out, and you were already out on the streets. I was a little bit of a slow learner, I guess, but, but you know, it, it depends on each individual person. I don't know, Tom, how about you? Uh, I became disenchanted uh, after the end of the Cold War in 1991, uh, and I was still on active duty and uh, at the uh, submarine headquarters in Pearl Harbor and watched the deployment of the Trident submarines not decrease after the end of the Cold War, but increase. And I uh, asked the question, what's it going to take? And the answer was, well, as long as the Russians are capable, we've got to be more ready. And if they're desperate, we've got to be more ready. And, and yes, I call bullshit. Um, and wasn't ever going to make Admiral. And uh, <laughs> so I uh, was in a position uh, where I could speak, uh, not out in public, but certainly in Navy circles, about the insanity of the so-called promise of deterrence. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thank you. Let's see. The gentleman in the back. Oh, Colonel Wright. Uh, I'm from Spokane also. That's Salish for Children of the Light. Um, I'd like to congratulate you for walking with the women across the DMZ. I really enjoyed watching that a lot. Isn't it true that the U.S. was instrumental in even breaking up the Koreans being able to visit their relatives since then, too? I thought I heard you mention yeah. that, but they can't even, they're, they're, gonna, they're dying and they can't even see them before they die now. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Oh, absolutely. You know, this travel ban means that uh, American, uh, Korean Americans cannot go to North Korea to see their families. Korean Germans can, because the German government uh, does not have a travel prohibition. It's only the United States that has a travel prohibition. North Korea has been closed for the last two years because of COVID, but now it's opening up. So there will be a lot of uh, families from other countries that will go, but our own Korean American families cannot go because of this, this travel ban. The other part of it is the missing in action. There are over 5,300 remains of U.S. service members that are identified. We know exactly the geographic location by coordinates of where bodies are. The North Koreans are willing to uh, help them, these remains come back, but the U.S. Is, has not been um, helpful uh, in uh, uh, saying we want these remains back. So the MIA and the divided families issues are two of the key issues that we're working on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you might be familiar with a man by the name of Ward Wilson. He's uh, written several books. He's dedicated his life to the anti-nuclear piece. But he's coming out with a new book called It Is Possible. And when you were talking about the end of the war being, uh, we won the war because of the bombs, he documents the information that has come out in other books, like the one Hiroshima and Nagasaki by Paul, on that, um, that really it was the emperor made up his mind because of the Russian declaration of war against them. And that's why the emperor decided to surrender. It had nothing to do with our bombs, because Japan had been bombed so many times, this is just a heck, I mean, just another bomb. And so it's very interesting. And he comes up, I'm hoping that when his book comes out in September, that maybe we can, we can sponsor a book discussion. And, and we'll, have copy, we'll try to make copies available. But it's, his book is called It Is Possible, and I just didn't know if you might be called, called It, it is, is Possible, and his name is? Ward Wilson. Ward Wilson. Yeah, the Thank book you. will be coming out on, on uh, September 26th, and he's hoping, he's got endorsements by, I don't know, 10 Nobel Prize winners. I mean, he's just got a lot of uh, important folks. <coughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's see, the gentleman in the back. Yes, do you have any advice for working in communities like this one or Oahu or Washington State in general that are so economically dependent upon the military uh, to, to change opinions and attitudes? Well, it's, uh, the question is, do you have any ad advice for communities where you have large military, uh, uh, the, the community is dependent on the military uh, bases for employment and things like that? Well, yeah, uh, it's that... Um, well, for us in, in Oahu, the, the, uh, sometimes it's a particular incident that gives you the opportunity to really mobilize community opinion. For us, it was in November of 2021 when all of a sudden uh, 93,000 people, primarily on the military bases around Pearl Harbor, started smelling jet fuel coming up in their water, dr drinking water, and it turned out that, that 19,000 gallons of jet fuel had been spewed inside one of the tunnels for the 80-year-old massive underground fuel tanks that had been in, inside one of the mountains above Pearl Harbor for 80 years. 80 years these, these tanks were built during World War II, really engineering marvels, but they were 80 years old and they were leaking and had been leaking for decades. And there had been big spills before, but this one in November of 2021 uh, was the one that we now have been able to use uh, to get those tanks finally closed by a directive of the Secretary of 
defense, uh, not because he wanted to, but because there was such community outrage that we were able to mobilize first the, the civilian citizens of Honolulu saying, you guys have now polluted our whole aquifer of Honolulu and, and 93,000 of your own people in the military are now having to live in hotels in Waikiki because they can't stay at home because of all the water. Um, we were able then to, the military families of course were, needless to say, disturbed by, by the fact that they were ending up in emergency rooms. I mean, we now have a whole group of, of military and civilians that were living on these bases uh, that will have long-term toxic effects from, from jet fuel. And trying to help them with lawsuits against the U.S. military to get them on lists and registers, kind of like the Agent Orange, uh, other places like uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, where the toxic spills there 50 years ago, people are still suing about it. All of these things have given us an opportunity to rail against other parts of, of the militarization of, of Hawaii. Right now we have a situation where uh, 27,000 acres of land that the military has used for the last 65 years they got leases on this from the state of Hawaii 65 years ago, and for 27,000 acres they paid $1. $1 for a 65-year lease. We want the lands back. I say the universal we, the people of Hawaii, want those lands back, and so we're using all of this, the, the opportunity now that we have that newspapers are covering uh, challenges to the military. Uh, whereas before the Red Hill spill happened, it was very difficult to get anything in the local newspapers or on TV. But now they are willing to, uh, to cover virtually anything that we, we have. So sometimes it takes another tragedy. Uh, but right now you've got this Manchester, the, the Manchester fuel tanks that you know, are dangerous to your community and trying to use that, use the Hawaii example saying, these things may do exactly to our community what it did to Oahu, so let's get these things uh, done. And with the Secretary of Defense having ordered the fuel tanks in Hawaii to be closed and emptied, this is a great opportunity for you all to jump right on this and say, well, do the same thing for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, I don't know about timing.